happy to be here today. I have to say, um, when we first started talking about this uh, a couple months ago, I didn't um, correlate today as being the last day of the quarter. So I don't know if anyone else on the call is in like, you know, Q1 ending um, freak out mode, but that's kind of uh, where I find myself today, but no better place to be than, than talking with others that are kind of, you know, in the same boat and uh, going through similar similar things in the industry. Um, I think it's the, you know, going on webinars and, and meeting with people at conferences and things like that is the, is the number one way that I stay sane in this industry because, you know, when we talk to our friends and families about what we do, I think a lot of them um, just, just have no idea, right? So when you try to explain it, it's, it's often lost on them. So without further ado, I'm going to start sharing uh, some of my slides. And um, I know, Baku, we didn't talk about when we're going to do the polls, but if people could um, put in the chat uh, what your primary industry is in, it's just, to, just to get the conversation kind of going. Um, I think Adrian mentioned he's not getting audio for some reason, but I uh, hopefully everyone else can hear me. So um, let's see. Let me know if you guys can see my... Oh, I just muted myself. Hold on. Let's see. Slideshow. Okay. Can you guys see my slides? Can I get a thumbs up? Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So, so my name is Tara Qualke. And yeah, so, so as, as mentioned, I've been doing proposals for a little over 12 years. And I've been with um, Blackline, uh, which is a publicly traded software company. We do um, finance and accounting automation. And they they went public in 2016. I've been there since uh, May of 2019, so coming up on three years. And we have just grown our team recently to to eight um, in the last uh, six weeks or so. So before that, we were we were five, and then we were three, and uh, you know back and forth with numbers. But now we're we're eight strong across the world, and it's um, and it's an exciting time for my company. And we do a very large volume of proposals. I don't know if uh, other teams get involved in things outside of strict RFPs and RFIs, but we also do a huge volume of ITQs. So information technology questionnaires, vendor surveys, and uh, making sure that our clients know how secure we are. And so I, I hopefully we'll get to talking about that a bit. And, and I wanted to see you know where everyone else is on that as well. So, so nice to meet you. Um, I had planned uh, a few more slides than, than you're going to see today, so hopefully we can fill some time with talking and sharing stories later on, um, but there was like a bunch of stuff I wanted to add to the slide, but, you know, I, I, if I don't know you already, I, you know, it's like we, when we have these, this kind of job in common, right, like we, we may not know each other, but we know each other, right, we, we kind of know how uh, the same frustrations and the same pain points, but also, um, I, I definitely want to get into some chats around uh, things that we can do to uh, help each other and what kinds of um, hacks and tips and tricks we can we can all share. Uh, so for us, there's uh, a couple different scenarios that that I want to go through, right? So um, for you know anything that's not in the federal space, I feel like is you know the timelines have been more rushed and and you know closer than they uh, they ever have been. So when we say at our company that our SLA is 10 business days, I would say better than half of the requests that come in are actually an ask of less than 10 business days. And so we kind of um, say in a perfect world, if we have 10 days, you know, here's all the things that we could do and, and how we would we would go for go forth with it, right? So in that that means the bid is very straightforward. We're well positioned. The we get our RFPs from sales reps directly, and so like the sales rep knows what's going on. Uh, they already have people in place, and we're ready to go. And we have those ten uh, full days, right? So that to me is what a perfect world is. Um, and in you know next down on the list, uh, you know a, a few missing pieces, right? Uh, they're not entirely sure um, what you know what the ask is. Maybe uh, the relationship isn't a very long relationship. Maybe they found us on on the internet and they're just sending us the proposal because uh, it's it's their procurement department's uh, you know deal to have to get at least three bids. So those ones feel a little bit different, right? You can you can kind of feel those ones out and and say like I think this is written for someone else. Are you sure they they're really interested in our solution? So um, that's where a, like a bid no bid process would come in place. 
uh, a lot. And then, you know, maybe they, maybe they're not sure who to ask to the kickoff call. So, you know, it doesn't mean we can't do it, but you know, there's just more pieces to fill in. And then what I'm calling a warm mess, uh, you know, th that's, we have five days or less, um, you know, they're kind of all over the place with the solution um, for my company specifically when I first started, it was very clear. We had a product set that they mixed and matched a little bit, but by and large, uh, everything was the same as far as, um, you know, what types of solutions would would best fit for our company. But since then, we've acquired two new companies. They have different uh, sets. Sometimes they play together. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we're dealing with partners. Sometimes we're not. Uh, and so just getting to uh, figuring out who's supposed to be at the table on these uh, warm messes, as I'm calling them, is is sometimes a little bit difficult. Um, not to mention if if communication is off, then it throws things into a tailspin, um, especially, you know, we, so we work at a global company and it's hard sometimes when you, when you log on early and you have, you know, a, a whole bunch of uh, asks or uh, confusing emails from other parts of the world and you, you're not able to necessarily um, reach out to them, <coughs> right then because they might not be online. So just trying to figure out uh, the best way to get everyone on the same page um, it, when when it's a rush timeline is is difficult sometimes. And then the the hot mess. So this is you know it's Friday morning. Uh, you know it's got to be due right now because it's due in Australia on Monday. So it, you know to to try and save you or your team from working over the weekend. Uh, you know you you reach out to all your SMEs. You call in all your favors. You do everything you can to uh, to help out. And then. You know, my favorite is a scenario where someone lobs something over the fence, there's barely any information, and then you reply asking them for more information and ask questions, and then you get their out of office. Um, so that, that to me is, you know, a nightmare scenario, um, but it happens, right? And so being able to keep your cool, try and figure out who else uh, can help. Um, and again, like, I, and I'll, I'll talk about the bid-no-bid no bid process a couple times through through my presentation, but you know it's um, it's interesting because we are still developing ours right now, and so uh, I think that that a lot of the like you know warm messes, hot messes would probably go to the wayside a bit more if, if something like that was in place. So just telling on ourselves that we don't have that yet. <laughs> so I'm saying that you know it it must haves right. Like what are the things that you absolutely should or or must have in place in order to to get to the finish line in, in 10 days or less, right? So, um, you know, and I recognize that not all uh, companies are built like ours in the way that our opportunities come in is through Salesforce or is through is through um, our CRM, the Salesforce, um, but it, our real Salesforce, right? Our sales team. Um, and so we ask them to open an opportunity with us in, in Salesforce and that's how we kind of get some of the back end information. Um, but we also, you know, re require our sales team to have the right people in place. Like for us, that looks like a solution consultant. They need to have the backing of their um, their RVP in, in, in our instance. Um, and we, we want them to engage us early. Uh, the, there's times, you know, and this I would throw into the warm mess category, right, is uh, you, can, you can see on the email thread clearly that they had it for a couple of days or a week, which when you have 10 days or less, that's that's not a great situation to put us in, right? So usually I give reps a pass, you know, if, if they do it one time, if they're new, they didn't know the process somehow, you know, fair enough. But um, when you have repeat offenders, it gets really difficult to uh, muster the strength to want to, to to put your best foot forward when you have these people who, are, you know, are routinely kind of like going outside the rules. So um, it, it's nice to have, you know, that relationship built with senior leadership to to go back and say like, hey, this is why we can't do it because, you know, it's not just our team that we're relying on, right? We're we're calling in all you know all the help from SMEs. We're using our proposal tool, but maybe the tool only has part of the answers or some of the answers. So um, when they're asking ten days or less of us, they have to know that it's not just us that 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 they're dealing with, right? That, that it's an untold amount of people. Um, as, I, as I like to say, you know, we're all professional cat herders, right? Like we might not know all the technical answers and all the details about how every product uh, works, but we have to know who to go to for these things, right? Um, so um, I think having the backstory from a rep's mouth, um, you know, it's, it's great to have a form and fill that out, fine. 
certainly need that, but we also need to know uh, the pain points, like things that are not written in the RFP. Tell us what you learned in the demo. Tell us how long you've been engaged with them. Has it been uh, four years and they went with a competitor last time and now they're back because uh, they didn't, they weren't happy with their services? Like give us whatever you, whatever you need to help us win the bid, right? And um, something I don't have written down here, uh, one thing that kind of drives me nuts is sometimes a rep will, will sit on it for two days and say, well, I wanted to, to make sure I knew exactly what it was and then send it over, blah, blah, blah. But then they'll send over, you know, this happened recently, um, they'll send over two, four, six, and eight. And you're like, well, where are the other ones? Oh, well, the other ones, I, don't, I didn't think you guys needed. One was pricing, one was this. It's like, no, <laughs> please send us everything because we, we need to have the full picture of what we're dealing with. We need to understand exactly what the ask is. Um, even if there's things like, it's like for instance, uh, at my company, we, we don't get involved on our side at, in pricing. I know other proposal teams do, and we have like whole courses and, and people in APMP that uh, in others, uh, organizations that, that know all about pricing and price to win strategies. We just don't do that, right? So that's one thing where, yes, we have the reps fill that out, but what if there's some questions in there that helps us understand the bit a bit better? And sometimes clients uh, aren't always the best at naming things, right? They might call something the pricing document and then they'll ask a bunch of diversity and supplier questions in there as well. Um, so we, we have to see everything, right? Uh, and including competitors, do we know who our competitors are? Uh, we have a whole competitor team at my company. So uh, we have what we call battle cards. So we know uh, where to go to find information about what we can say to position ourselves a bit better. Um, if known, and then executive buy-in, right? Like not everything is going to be a good fit. Even if you don't have a formal bid, no bid process in place, you can and should feel empowered to raise the red flag on something that seems iffy, fishy. If it's a low dollar value, I mean, if it's a low dollar value, they're asking for it under 10 days. They don't really have a backstory. Like, tell me where the good fit is. Like, tell me why I should spend time on your bid versus uh, something that is a high ACV yeah, we almost a slam dunk, you know, because we don't want to take away our time and energy and resources uh, to bigger bids that we're, we're well positioned to win to, for something that is, is a shot in the dark, right? Um, we're developing right now, and I don't have um, slides on this. I, I have notes on slides that I wanted to make about this, uh, was is a, is a proactive proposal. So um, that's something I want to, when we get to the chatting part, um, I want to talk about a bit more and see what other people are doing around that. But a proactive proposal could be something like, it's it's a it's a no for us. We're not able to fill fill out all your documentation. We don't have the the resources. But here's what we can do instead, and we can get away with that, guys. In in the B two B world, a lot more than federal bids, right? I've been on the other side of things in the federal space before, where if you're not like filling out every little checkbox and every little signature and all the forms, even if they're irrelevant you'll get tossed, right, in the federal space because it has to match up. It has to be one for one. But in the B2B space, you know, if you get involved in the capture side of things uh, or you get with your business development team and you build out that stuff with them before an RFP drops, you can possibly prevent an RFP from even coming out. That's the, that's the dream scenario for a rep, certainly, is winning the business before they go to RFP. That happens sometimes. But also once we get it and it's it's not a good fit for us because of timing, money, whatever, then we can still give them this this beautiful proactive proposal and they 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 have the choice to evaluate it or not. Like and they and they may not. They may they may say, nope, sorry, it's in a portal. We have to have everyone do it this way. And then and then we make a decision on whether we move forward. So on the proposal side of things, um, you know, I think a kickoff call is absolutely crucial for true RFPs and RFIs. And I say true RFPs and RFIs because again, my company specifically, we do tons of ITQs and those generally do not require a kickoff call. Uh, those are pretty standard answers. Talking about our security, where are our data centers? Like what's our encryption rate? Um, you know, well, what can you do in, you know, in the event of a disaster? Um, you know, all, all those types of things. Um, so we, we typically don't have a kickoff call for that, but getting the, the right players, to the table at the very beginning is crucial. And we usually do it within 24 hours, 48 at the most. Um, because when you have only 10 days, it doesn't mean we don't get started on other things. We've been lucky enough uh, at my company to hire a proposal coordinator recently. 
So she is in place to set up the folders, start triaging the bid, start getting a, a, a matrix together of who's going to be doing what. And um, we're using a combination of our RFP tool and OneDrive to keep track of these things. And then she sends a wrap up email um, after the kickoff call. It's, it's, it's great. It's working really well. Um, but capturing those notes and being able to go back to those or you know, being able to record the call if, if we are working on teams that are in multiple different time zones or parts of the world, right? So like not everyone can be at everything, right? So being able to record those kickoff calls for someone who's a key player to watch later is crucial. Um, as I'm saying that, I just realized we don't usually uh, record our kickoff calls and we probably should. So if uh, Lisa is watching, <laughs> we should do that. Um, and then content library. So, you know, not all companies give you the, the, the dollars to spend to have a, an RFP360, a Lupio, a Quorus, a Quividian, any of these um, bigger names, um, tools, Ombud is one. Uh, for us, we do use Lupio. Um, and, you know, some people have like a robust SharePoint. Uh, I mean, it just depends, right? I know my mentee uses a, a SharePoint site because they, they aren't able to, to get the spend yet for a uh, content library, but having something is crucial, right? You don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. You want to be able to have something that you can pull from that is, is not going to make you spin your wheels every single time. I mean, it's absolutely crucial. Um, I spelled delegation wrong in that uh, bullet point, and that's going to bother me forever. I clearly did not do a spell check, um, <laughs> so that's fine. Um, but, but delegating tasks and having that clear ownership is, is also paramount to, to success, right? Uh, we don't, we got one in yesterday. This is an absolute true story from late yesterday. We had a request in um, from a support team of ours. Then they opened a ticket with our production or our um, prod ops team. Uh, and then somebody else, I mean, long, long, long story short to say that it went to three different teams within our company. And thank God somebody called it out to, to tell us that because the, the delegation was all over the place. We could have possibly, on the second to last day before a quarter ends, had three different teams working on the same thing, with all with the other two pointing back to RFP saying, "Did you talk to Tara?" Um, so luckily, we got that figured out. But it took, you know, 40 minutes of unraveling, which it was 40 minutes I, I honestly did not have yesterday, right? So um, make sure that that you know who's doing what, and that the the tasks are very clear. Um, and if not, ask questions. I'm, I'm a huge fan of like. I, I don't know uh, as far as communication, I'm getting into that on a later slide, but uh, whatever channels you have in your company, use them, whether it's Teams, Slack, like whatever it is, uh, I, I think just trying to make sure you're on the same page is, is really key. Um, and then a process document. Um, I can, if, if there's time, I can show you ours, like our, a, a sample chart we have. It's a little busy, um, but, but it, it keeps us on track as far as like in a perfect world with 10 days, who does what along the timeline and, and what, it, it, you know, in a typical bid. Um, and then SME buy-in, you know, building those relationships with your SMEs is such a great idea to do early on when you first start a company, right? Like first start at a company, you can set up meetings proactively, introduce yourself, make sure that they know who you are, what you guys do, and, and what, why their piece of the puzzle is so important, right? Um, for me, I, I always joke with SMEs that like they can give me anything they want as long as it's not in wing ding font or something crazy and we'll clean it up and make it pretty. And it, like, I don't want to ever, I know that SMEs have a lot more going on than just proposals. Like that's all we do all day, the end, right? But it, you know, it's often a hassle for them. It's a pain in the butt. So keeping that content library fresh so that we're not going back to them for the same answers over and over. I mean, that's super frustrating. I mean, nothing's more frustrating than when you go to an SME for something and they're like, isn't that in Lupio or your, you know, insert proposal tool. And, and that, that gets to be frustrating because in our mind, it's like, if it was there, we wouldn't ask you. Um, but sometimes questions are asked in such a way that it's not clear that that's the answer. Like we didn't know this also meant that. So when you get that Intel, you can, uh, our tool, for instance, allows us to put alerts or notes in that don't attach to the record. Ergo, if you're pulling that answer into something, it's not going to attach all your notes that Christopher said on 319, blah, 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 like we, because we don't want to accidentally pull that into a bid. But um, we created, I created when I first started here, uh, a cheat sheet, right? Literally. And my team 
updates it daily. We, you're not, maybe not daily, but weekly. When we get new names, if somebody's left the company, somebody gets promoted into a new role, we're constantly, I mean, we updated it yesterday, literally. And, and I'm not afraid to share that with anyone in our, in our company who also hears about it or wants to see it. Uh, just, just so that we understand um, who to go to in a pinch, especially like, you know, again, like four o'clock on Friday, we have two questions left and we've got to get this out the door. Um, knowing where the bodies are buried is, is really helpful. And then I think I already talked about a process um, document. Um, yeah, I just did that. Um, and then, you know, some sort of way to track requests and metrics. Again, we use Salesforce. Uh, there's a lot of robust reporting that we are trying to start taking advantage of. Um, you know, again, having hired five people in the last couple of weeks, some of the stuff I, that is on my wish list has fallen to the wayside, but hoping to ramp that up in the next couple of quarters. But, and then, and then like, how do you define what you, what is a win for you? Um, we were having this debate on my team recently. If we are invited to the RFI, we make it to the RFP, but we end up not ultimately winning. I still personally believe that's a win in, in some respects, right? But uh, because, because you won enough to go to the next stage. That said, you know, we also track all of our requests. So for a big company, we might, they might come back to us two, three, four, 10 times uh, for additional questions. And we track those as a one-off email um, or a follow-up, right? So, uh, you know, it, so at the end of the day, there might be 10 touch points, but we, we don't want to count that accidentally as 10, as 10 wins, right? So it's a matter of like digging into your data. If you have you know a Salesforce person or a CRM expert uh, within your company? Make friends with them, get them, get on their calendar, and see what they can help you uh, accomplish. Um, there's so much going on in Salesforce that I'll never be the expert on, and would love to lean on their expertise to 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 dig into that stuff. Um, especially being an accounting company, uh, in finance company, we they love numbers and metrics. So to be able to deliver that uh, to senior leadership, uh, not just is a good idea, but if you need more headcount, if you're saying you're under, you're overwhelmed and, and you can come to them and say, literally, we did X amount of bids, it won this much money, this is why we need more headcount, right? Um, and, and that's what I had to do for my team um, in order to, to, to fight for more. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it should go without saying that a final review of what you're sending out is, is absolutely one of the most critical steps, right? We're all human beings. We all make mistakes. Uh, we've all been staring at the same, you know, bit for for ten days or less, and we need, you know, a colleague to to spot check us to to make sure that we're on track. That you know, whether it's whether it's an initial review of just like spelling, grammar, and responsiveness, if that's all you can get done, it's still better than nothing, right? Uh, in a perfect world, you'd want to be able to dig through and, and go through the technical answers and make sure we're on point. Um, sometimes a question asks three to five things. And so if you're just saying yes, but they said, please describe, and you didn't describe, that's not being responsive, right? So uh, having someone in place at company to, to help do that. Um, and if you're a team of one, uh, God love you. I've been there. I, I know how hard that is, uh, but you have to get creative, right? Like you have to try and uh, get leadership to to allow you to at least borrow someone from another team or, you know, maybe a contractor or something like that to help. Um, so then let's go to, did I skip this slide? No, so nice to haves, right? Um, you know, it's always fun when you get an extended timeline. A lot of times that comes from, it's always good news when you submit questions to a vendor and they don't come back on the day that they said they would, right? then you can kind of rest assured that they're probably going to extend the deadline because they weren't expecting that many questions. They didn't have time to answer them. Fine. Um, so, so when you get an extended timeline, great. I still sometimes like to try to work within the original deadline, uh, not to be a masochist or anything, but just so that we, um, just so that we, you know, try to get it off our plate if possible. If we're already near the finish line and then they extend it, who cares, you know, might as well submit it. But if we were if we were a little wonky or we missed a review because it was a rush and then we get that extended timeline, then take that time, right? Like breathe, try and see if you can make anything a little uh, clearer. Um, use those questions and answers once they come back to see if it bolsters anything in your bid. If there's something that you need to edit because you misunderstood uh, the original meaning, you know, take that take that time. Um, and then I have already touched on this in the in the past slide, but uh, you know those those strong SME relationships, um, you know kill them with kindness, right? Like they're doing us huge favors by helping us out. Um, and, you know, you, you don't want to 
make them feel put upon. So as much time as humanly possible that you can give them is, is awesome. And I always stress to my team too, always have a due date in your emails to SMEs, right? If you're, if you're emailing a team and there's no due date, you're probably going to get ignored, right? They're going to do the, the not it game. They're going to say, you know, oh, I thought so-and-so was doing it. Well, I didn't know the timeline. So, you know, I don't overuse the, the, um, the high importance button, but if it's, it, it, but if I need the answer that day, uh, I explained to them that, you know, we just got it yesterday. We tried to answer it. We couldn't, here you go. Um, another tip I, I like to do is if, if there's a, you know, let's say 20 privacy questions, I know the answer to about 15 of them. I'm going to answer as best as I can, I'm going to send it to our person and say, Hey, uh, can you double check my answers, correct anything that is a mistake and fill in the blanks. They'd much, they're, they're going to be a lot happier if you give it the old college try first, right? Like if you are really trying to get to the right answer, instead of just dumping blank questions on them at all times. And if, and if everything's a rush, nothing's a rush. So in, in the 10 days, it's, it's a difficult balance. You can't get them. You cannot always get SMEs questions on day one, honestly, like, because that same day you might have three other bids due, right? So keeping multiple projects, you know, in the air at a time is, is crucial, right? Like, so, so I say you, you got to work you, you got to work a little bit on each of them every day if you're assigned to, to multiple, right? So on a first day, you'd want to make sure you're getting, um, you, you, that you're getting the legal at least. And we try to get legal involved um, early on if there's terms and conditions to accept or things like that. Uh, and, you know, getting all the bids set up the, the right way. Again, we have a coordinator now, so it's a lot easier. But in the past, we'd have to take that time to set things up. Um, and then maybe on other bids that are a little bit further along in the process, uh, you know, within two to three days, you should try to get, I, I try to do a run through of the, of the, the questions and I don't necessarily answer the ones that I know I might mark the ones that I don't know. Right. And then start getting those out to the right people and then go back the next day and start answering the ones you do know. So that way they can start working on it. You give them a firm deadline of when it's due and be very cognizant of the time zones guys. Right. Like for us, we work in so many different countries. And if it's due in Australia on the 15th, it means we pretty much have to be penciled down on the 13th, right? To allow for them to have a little bit of time to uh, review the bids and, you know, clean up anything that they might want to. Um, and then the bid, no bid process, um, you know, it's it, the power of no is, is nice to have, but there's going to be times where even if you do have a, a formal bid, no bid process in place, if you know, it makes a certain score. And if it's not an eight or above, I'm just like making up numbers here, it, you know, it's not going to get bid on, right? There's still going to still be outliers where it's like, well, we have this special relationship. And even though the ACV is very small, it could grow into this big thing because they're just testing us out. So you have to like, every situation is different and fluid. Um, but at least if you have some sort of formal template in place, they can understand that you actually do win more business when you say no sometimes because it's not a good, I, I remember um, when I was being interviewed, I, uh, I asked what their bid over process was. And the answer was, we're not in the business of saying no. And so, you know, that sat with me for a while. Cause I'm just like, well, that seems very onerous and, and not, not like a, a great strategy. So, you know, a full three years later, we're still talking about it and still trying to implement something. Um, and, and of course, if it's not a good fit in as far as we just don't do what they're asking or they or we only do one of two things and it's a single source award, then then what are we doing, right? So you still have the power to raise the red flag even if uh, even if other people are saying that we got to go forward with it. Um, uh, also nice to have is proposal templates, right? Uh, we have a very basic one uh, at my company and we have two people on our team diligently working uh, to, to get that updated, to make it pretty, to uh, have different templates too for different products. Um, so it's, it's not that you can't submit a bid without a proposal template, but you want to see consistency, right? Like if, if they come back to us year over year or they have follow-ups or whatever, we don't want our templates and, and our responses to look wildly different from the last time, right? We want to show that, that branding, talk to your marketing team, like talk to your product marketing or, or, or whoever it is in your team that handles branding and stuff, because they will likely have your, your color schemes, like all the, the R, RGB um, 
uh, colors and all that stuff, right? And in, in styles and formatting, um, it, I think in fonts, um, that's what I was trying to say, um, uh, because it, it goes a long way. You know, you, you will never, um, we're never gonna win a bid based on, you know, how pretty something is necessarily, but we might lose because of it, right? If we're sh saying this is our best foot forward and there's errors and mistakes and it looks wonky and the spacing sucks and you're cutting things off at the end of the, I mean, it, it just looks sloppy, right? Um, and if, if you, it, it, it doesn't hurt, right? Those are free points to win in my mind. Um, and then a wrap up meeting, there's not always time, but if, if you, if something went kind of weird and it, things were all over the place or um, ownership wasn't clear, we had a bid recently where it felt like there was not just too many cooks in the kitchen, but it, it like it's like the ownership change. I feel like once it gets lobbed over the fence to the RFP team, the proposal team, that it's kind of ours to take to the end, right? To, to take to, to, to middle. So having people come in that don't know the process, like. I think it's on us to tell them what the process is versus like asking them, like, do you want me to make the meeting or do you want to make the meeting? No, we make the meeting. We make, we, we send out the invites, we send out the updates, we keep everyone on track and we're the, the project managers really. Um, so, so being able to discuss that in a, in a wrap up meeting um, in, in wrap up meetings should happen the, the week after a bid goes out because you know, you get a month down the road, two months down the road, you forget about that nightmare from January. Like there, there's like almost nothing to talk about at that point. So if you're going to have them. Um, and we do such a large volume. We did over 1300 responses last year. That includes um, that includes the one-off emails and sending out security documents and stuff. But if we're talking about true proposals and ITQs, it's probably around 700. Um, and, and so there's obviously not time to do that on every single bid. That's a little nuts. In fact, but the ones that are big ones that are kind of messy um, and definitely talk about the things that went well too. Like what are the repeatable processes that we did in this one uh, to get to the finish line, right? That we wanna make sure we we use going forward. Um, here's just a couple of variables that could um, um, affect um, uh, how you prioritize bids, right? Um, a high ACV or dollar value with a, with a known brand or label that we've been courting for a really long time. Um, the relationship's great. You know, those often take precedence, honestly, uh, especially um, with with how much time is spent on a bid. Like if, if we only have 10 days and you want to knock it out of the park, uh, then, you know, the ones that come in with less time, smaller ACV, and uh, we don't seem like a good fit, like, you know, we have to explain to the rep why we're not going to be able to necessarily give it the, the, the uh, white glove treatment, right? Um, and then uh, for current clients too, a lot of times they're like, oh, you guys acquired XYZ company. Oh, you now do this. Okay, well, we're going to go out to bid again, even though you're a current client of, you know, we're already doing business with you in this segment. We want to grow it to this, right? So oftentimes they get priority as well because uh, we're already doing good work for them and, and why not increase that value? Um, it seems like a no-brainer to me. Um, and then uh, new solutions. Uh, so, you know, maybe it is a low dollar value, but I mean, we just acquired a company in February. So uh, we haven't even seen a bid yet come through for that product, uh, but we're trying to already build up our library, build up those SME relationships so that when something drops, we're ready to go. And of course, uh, a goal of our companies is to, to is to bring on as much business um, in that realm as possible this year. So, so you, you, you bet your butt that when that one comes out, we want to we want to prioritize it so that we can start building our name in that space. So. How a couple of key takeaways. So this is a little floofy here. I'll 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 get I'll give you that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, guys, we're not flying spaceships. Like no one, no one's like carrying cancer here. Like it, it, we're we're human beings dealing with other human beings. And when you put that kind of emotion into it and 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 like assume the best intent, if you feel like someone's being ornery to you or asking the moon and the stars, consider. We have no idea what people are walking through in this life. We don't, I, at my company right now, we just started going back into the office and I, I don't know when I'll be going back, if at all, right? And, and every single person I hired in the last six weeks all lives in a time zone that is not mine, right? So I don't know when I'll get to meet these people in person. So we never know what's going on behind the scenes with, with other reps, with the people that we're dealing with the most, um, because we don't have the benefit of like seeing them at the coffee machine or whatever. And and so just assume that like, it, don't take it personally. If someone, if someone's being short with you or whatever, like we're human beings dealing with other human beings who have other things going on outside of life. So, you know, be patient and the more consistent your team can be, 
uh, I think the easier it is for, for uh, our, we call our clients our internal reps, like it's, it's easier for them to, to know what to expect from our team. Like if, if it's all over the place and we're not responding to emails for two days, but then, uh, then sometimes we're responding in 20 minutes, like try and have some sort of consistency around that so that they, they know what the SLA is and what uh, your team can provide. And so communication and prioritization. Um, again, I, I just think having, asking the questions um, and, and, and making sure that you guys are on the same page is, is so important. Like if some, this is, this is a pet peeve of mine. Somebody asks for a rush, you reply to them immediately. And then you don't hear back from a day for a day. And you're like, I can't move forward without this other key information. So uh, if it's truly a rush, then, then be engaged, you know, and, and, you know, then ping them on teams or, or whatever your internal channels are. Um, and I say remain teachable. Uh, you don't know what you don't know, right? Uh, there is so many, it, our industry is growing and the, the learning modules behind it are, are increasing all the time. Like, what, what Baskar is doing um, with Baku Scribble is just amazing. Like the, the free courses and the, the emails and the blogs and the webinars and, and the um, podcasts and stuff, you know, dig into those guys, like schedule time for yourself, you know, each week, like an hour or whatever to do some, uh, you know, work in the, in the field, right? You can, you can certainly be on a, a webinar yourself. You can volunteer to, to speak on a, a APMP chapters a monthly uh, call or whatever, you know, even if even if it's not your chapter, I, I strongly encourage people to get involved. You, there's so many things you learn uh, that that wouldn't even even cross your mind by attending these things, by uh, you know being a guest on them. Uh, and and everybody has a story to tell. Everybody has knowledge to share, right? So you can write an article for free, right? Right? You can publish it on LinkedIn or Medium or whatever, uh, and. Either there's there's so much learning that can be done. Getting getting certified, not just in APMP, but it, but lots of places. SMA offers certification. Uh, certainly Shipley and others. Um, and ask for help. Like I I I'm mentored. I have ment I have a mentee. I ask for help inside my organization and outside. Right. So I have a contact. Uh, you know, I have lots of contacts in APMP that I can bounce ideas off of. Um, but also people in, in my company that, that aren't in my role, that aren't even in my vertical, right? So, uh, so that, that, I can, that I can understand how things work within my own company if I'm, if I'm getting frustrated with something. Um, and, and just don't be stuck in your ways. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the six weeks that I've hired these new folks, everyone's come to me with different ideas. Some are a good fit for now. Some are like, maybe not. Um, and some are like, that's awesome, but let's revisit it in six months. So like, be open to being a sponge and, and learning from the people around you. All right, here we go. So this is where I kind of want to open it up to, um, and then I have, wait, this is my last slide actually really quick. So this is like how to reach me, blah, blah, blah. I think I'm the only Tara Kowalki in the world, so I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> um, but uh, so I want to know what some of your um, your hacks are for, uh, you know, getting things done quicker. Um, to any any horror stories people want to share, uh, pet peeves, all of that. So I don't know how to move That's, off of this. Thank you for this. For, for a practical, practical um, kind of an overview of how you run things. I think you all have been living in this utopian world of uh, two-year procurement life cycle with a 30-member team and a capture manager, production manager. But in reality, it's just one person and a 10 uh, kind of uh, timeline. And you kind of nicely put together the journey. Uh, let me launch the poll. I think just to get a feel for it. I think, yeah, please. Um, let, let's do the poll. I think the poll just asks you two questions. One is how many people are there in your team? So let's get a feel for it. And secondly, how many proposals do you have going at once? So I launched the poll, answer that. Um, it's just two simple questions. In the meantime, there are a couple of questions, uh, Tara. Let me ask those things. And then the others have a few more. I will just go from there. Um, sure. Tara, the very first question is then, I'll, I'll just I'll start with mine. Tara, 10 day, assume you have 10 days to close a bed. How do you plan this? In your mind, just talk us through, where do you start? How do you close it? So um, let, me, uh, let me share something. So this is, um, again, I'm prefacing this with, this. It's, a, it's a bit busy. Do you want me to end the, the poll or no, there's people still doing the poll. Okay, so let me let, let them do that. Uh, yeah. maybe another five okay. 
before we close it don't worry guys this is anonymous totally anonymous and uh, um and you know what we just want to get a feel for it so that we could use the next 10 minutes to customize the responses yeah um so this is i mean again this is a, you know it's a bit busy but we you know what once something is released we um we acknowledge receipt i know that sounds silly but you know people want to feel heard they want to know that their message was received so like email them back and say hey we got it we're working on it we're going to let you know who's who's going to be helping right um so again if there's a bid no bid process in place uh that should happen uh pretty pretty early on or before it even comes to you um and then you know hosting kickoff calls you know determining if there's clarifying questions um all that kind of some of this stuff ha happens in tandem um and then you know we want to have the outline created and filling in as many answers as we possibly can um utilizing smes and then you know working to tailor the response later on in the bid um and then anything that's non-standard you know making sure that we're, we have the right people in place so that it's not a last minute rush and then finalizing you know around date nine or so and then we we actually give our reps the bid to to submit back to the end client and so they they actually have the final sign off on that um so yeah oh, oh excellent graphic i will say i'll do a plug here so dragonfly editorial um is a company we work with um women owned out of ohio they uh are huge apmp people as well um uh sam enslin is um the ceo and uh they they help us with uh graphics and making things pretty and they're helping us with our templates right now and they're a great company so yeah so i so i cannot take credit for that <laughs> <laughs> I know it's the tech behind it but how you get the cute things i don't know it's just not me thank you tara that was useful again and it's, it's important i think once you know that your time scales is around a certain period which is 10 days or seven days it's important for you to document that so that when you onboard somebody they can just take it and run with it otherwise as tara mentioned early on you might get stuck in one and and because you're a very short time scale so it's important that was very useful Tara. again poll results have come i think there is a there's a nice balance i think i have i think uh, uh, half by uh, one third of the people are uh, one person team superstar team and then uh, and and then you have a blend between one to ten member looks like it's somewhere between one to ten is the maximum and then we have you are on the corporate side and well, regard choice Four. I'm like, what's choice four? <laughs> it's level, it should be level plus, but for some reason it's okay. just do that. And also regarding the number of proposals, I think uh, at once was the question, and it's unbelievable, yeah. where um, many people do 20 proposals uh, at once. I think at least, uh, you know, I mean, like a small percentage is up to 11 to 20. And for most others, you do somewhere between one to 10. That was very useful. Thank you. So for us because we weren't able to because i'm not able to enter in the poll because i'm a panelist but um we do between 20 and 35 at all times on our team like we have that many going at once um so that's interesting to see um for sure and with the timelines too i always say work backwards right like you find out what it, you know it's due in japan on this date so we have to have it on at this date and then what what happens like going backwards from it right so uh, so that we're in a position to get it uh, to where it needs to be. Totally, thank you, Tara. So what, what Tara kind of alluded to was, uh, you know, what in addition to the ten-day time timeline, it's also any time zones as well. So that comes with the zone baggage of, especially now with the clock change just this week in UK, that one hour lost could be a make or break for many of you because deadlines one hour before is where more bits get submitted. So let me start with some questions. Um, start, starting with Michael's question, any thoughts on tools to use um, uh, for, okay, let me read the full question. I feel, a, I really feel a big no bid tool will help, especially as with will encourage the capture managers to follow best practice. Any thoughts on tools to use, or would you be interested in using something like an Excel solution with a graduated rating scheme? How do you use your big no bid uh, tool, Tara? Um, so, like I said, we're still developing it. Um, there is a company called Patri, P-A-T-R-I, uh, that that literally has the the corners of the marketplace on helping people uh, get to the bid no bid. They have like a a qualitative tool you can use that that you can build into your process. Um, 
So we're, uh, if you want to put that in the chat, um, they're, they're awesome. Uh, I know the CEO, Josh, is a big member of APMP as well. And we're, we're ta talking with them right now. So we do have, I, I, I don't want to share it because it's not final, <laughs> um, but we do have a matrix where you um, can score things, right? And so each different section gets a score. Um, if you, so I would honestly, I would just Google Patry and maybe have a demo with them because they're they're awesome at it. Um, and we're we're trying to see if we can uh, get the get the dollars in place to do that. Um, you can definitely still do one on your own, even if you don't have a, a formal system. And it doesn't mean that everything would need to go through that system, right? So we get a ton of uh, repeat business, I will say. So clients that, and I'd be interested to see in the chat. Uh, can people tell me if anyone works on things that are not just RFPs and RFIs? Like, did, do other people do ITQs as well? So a large volume of what we do on my team is current clients that uh, give us annual vendor surveys, right? So they are things that we have to tell them year over year that we're still as secure as we said we were last time. Sometimes uh, that looks like just updating the same one from last year. Sometimes it's a brand new portal. They want us to fill it out from scratch. And there's no ACV attached to it. So we're not winning any money, but we still want to do a great job and let them know. Um, like for instance, our uh, one of the differentiators for our company is that we have twice uh, twice yearly SOC reports, right? And so it, it, they're very expensive to do. They're a long undertaking. And even Google, for instance, only does it once a year. So, it, so it's good for us to be able to say that we can do that um, uh, twice a year. So yeah, I had some other questions too. If... Uh, the chat goes silent or do you have any, uh, oh, Adrian, you do tons of, yeah, we, I remember we talked about this. Yeah. Um, you have three people solely focused on that. That's awesome. Um, we kind of divvy up those responsibilities and we have, now that I have a larger uh, team, we, we do kind of silo things into like this person does ITQs only. And there's other people on the team that do both RFPs and ITQs and then others that only do RFPs. So uh, we're trying to figure out like the where the sweet spot is for that for sure. Um, yep. So okay, Claire says they do all the repeat new supplier forms. Okay. Yep. For landfill sites and, and PDQs. Yep. And then the tenders. So that that's the one thing that we that we differ on is we don't do the new supplier forms like the onboarding forms. Uh, we do have a team that we can pass that off to. Usually billing where they want like the banking information, our EIN number, you know, W nines. But again, in a pinch, uh, last night at 11.30, <laughs> I was filling out uh, one where I was uploading, you know, some things that billing would typically do that way when they woke up this morning, they only had uh, like five or six questions left versus uh, 16, right? Just because it was due today. Um, so yeah, that's interesting to know. Um, and then do other people use proposal software tools right now? Again, we use Lupio. We used to use RFP360. I have experience with Quibidian and uh, Course Breeze and a bunch of others. Um, do you guys do any of those, uh, or or do you have a homegrown solution for for those of you who are on smaller teams? Uh, I just leave uh, the the attendees to to put it on the chat, um, Tara. But from my experience, I think uh, product based companies like US, uh, uh, that sort of automation tools helps because you do a lot more proposals than most. But service based organizations tend to struggle with those. It actually wastes more time than actually. Because you you don't do and uh, you you might do like thirty bids a year in service based proposals, whereas yeah. uh, whereas in product based you do thirty a week or something. That's how how we how we do it. But uh, but I wouldn't. Uh, it's, it's not for everybody. But as you rightly said, product companies doing the same thing repeatable. Uh, maybe it adds value. But we have Eric Eric here, here as well as a as a as an attendee. Obviously, Eric uh, might know. He has seen forty years of uh, people doing bids. But uh, that's that's good. So. I think yeah. I'll wait for another two minutes before I open up uh, the scribble quest. Three questions from the stock. Whoever yeah. answers, as, as you know, will get uh, we'll we'll some points. Responses. Yeah, we we'll got some responses in the chat too. Shelf, Adrian, I've never heard of that. Um, and then Claire, uh, Claire, I'm I'm wondering which one you trialed that was dreadful. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. And yeah, and some uh, I know like Ombud, we we uh, had a demo with them, and they're a great company, but. They're geared towards federal and uh, proposals, right? Where they had a model, and maybe it's changed. So forgive me if anyone uses it that's on the call. But at the time, it was like you you could you know you get charged per proposal if you go over twenty. And so I'm like over twenty. Oh my god, we do hundreds, right? So so for us, our model looks like 
we um, we have unlimited unlimited proposals and we get charged per user versus RFP 360, which I know they merged with um, another company recently. Uh, so so their model has changed, but at the time we had unlimited users, but only a set amount of proposals we could do. So so it's just a balance of what's what's right for your company. Um, totally. Yeah. Okay, Michelle. We are Mitch as well, I'm sure, from, from your chapter, <laughs> Tara. Yeah. Um, and Mitch, uh, Mitch is sharing his experiences, but coming from a grand side, I think Mitch is a legend, and uh, um, you know, Mitch is sharing that you know they spent a lot of time yeah, with solution and looks like Monday.com is where they went. And again, that's- I don't know them. I don't know them. Uh, yeah, know them. there's a lot of, uh, two, I think that is, the market is kind of merging now. So most people, even they don't call themselves as, proposal automation anymore because it's devalues them. So they try to call them as sales enablement tools now. And when position yourself as a sales enable, the lot more, lot more tools that they could go for. Again, you know, good luck to everybody who was considering, um, considering or not considering, etc. There's a checklist within Apache Scribble. You can go and find about proposal automation. We have audited that five, six tools, the pros and cons is also there. So let me go back. Uh, please to have your uh, thoughts coming, um, you know, a few, few things about it, but let me open up the Scribble quest and uh, and then we'll come back if there is any questions to it. Okay, ready? So three questions starting now. As you know, anyone, whoever tries it correct, even if you didn't get the first one, also get a point. So don't worry whether you didn't come first, but even if you answer it correctly, uh, you're still getting it. So the in the very first slide, um, Tara mentioned typical scenarios. Obviously, she had a warm and a hot mess, but what was the other two options, the first two options? Tara, you can't answer, by the way. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm keeping quiet. <laughs> Kelsey got one. <laughs> exactly. Good, Kelsey. Well done, you. So Kelsey got that. The second one is, there is a beautiful slide uh, in the nice to have part where Tara talks about strong SMA relationship. And while talking about that, Tara used, uh, uh, Tara used a beautiful word, which is how to engage with SMEs, which is kill them with dash. What was that? <laughs> I should have left the whole statement, but I made it. Go. Nice, Tamara, nice. Because I think that's important because uh, you never know what the other person is going through on the day, going through the minute. And the only thing you could do is just to stay kind. You know, that's a beautiful point. Um, yeah, they were very fast because they all are legends in Scribble Quest. Uh, Claire, very, very you will get used to it. If you attend more, you'll be, you'll be used to it. So uh, the third and the fourth, the third question was Tara mentioned that, you know, if you kind of miss out all the, remove all the responses like the emails and quotes and stuff, What's the number of proposals that they do in a year? <laughs> oh, in a year, in a year. Ooh. More than 20, that's technically correct. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so, okay, let me, let me, the bigger answer was 1,300. But when you filter it off, you let remove the emails and the quotes and stuff. She said another number, which is less than 1,000, by the way, but more than 20, as Michelle pointed out, totally. Close? Anybody wants to try? Claire, Claire got pretty close with 750. <laughs> exactly. Claire, we'll give it to you, Claire. It's 700. So there were, again, the last one from this is, the very first slide talked about scenarios. Then it was must-haves. Then it was nice have. What was the other slide after nice have? Oh man, what, I don't even remember. Now I have to look. <laughs> the title for after nice have, as she talked about, um, you know, learn, share. There was a nice title that she attached to that. Anybody? They should, they should win two prizes if they get this. <laughs> Exactly, because you made it so practical, because normally people come with 40 slides, so it's very easy, but you made it so practical, it was uh, it was quite hard. So anyway, anyway, I think the first thing, this was a bonus question, Tara, do you want to answer it? 
Yes, it was um, variables uh, affecting prioritization. Correct, variables affecting prioritization, that's it. So again, that's it, because this is, you know, we all live in this world, most of the talks or even the APMP syllabus is, is, is dwells on federal government. I find it challenging week on week training people but the reality is, is 10 days, whereas the APMP talks about two years. Um, and then the federal government, capture managers, production managers, proposal designers, where in real world, it's just one person trying to do everything. So this session um, is, is just a starting point of bringing more commercial experts who do bring the best of the best, but within the shortest time as well. So Tara was one. Tara, thank you for joining. And um, I think if uh, next week we will have Angie, Angie Wolf, um, Angie will be talking about a guide how to hire a consultant. That's it. I think you know, we, we, we get to different flavors and every week, 7, uh, 3 p.m. Thursday is what we are doing. So the webinar will be available on demand, as I mentioned, for two days from registration. You can access it with the same link, the recording and the slides and the related resources will be emailed out tomorrow. Any questions, you have Tara's details, drop her a line. As Tara mentioned, she'll be in Dallas. I'll be in Dallas. Looking forward to meet some of you uh, there face-to-face. -face. Otherwise, I'll see you next week with Angie Wolf. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, Tara. Take care. Thanks Bye. Please do share your feedback to us, and that'll be great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.